Hey, welcome to the video. If you're sensitive to discussion of misogyny, reclaimed use of the word queer, or discussion of revolution, please take care when watching this video. There will also be spoilers for everything pictured on screen. Please consider supporting the channel by getting some merch at our store linked below. Hey, it's 2024, Bucky. I'm finishing this exactly as I wrote it in 2021 with no changes and posting it. Opinions and characteristics of myself and the people featured in this video may or may not have changed. Please don't bother any of them over it. I just needed to finish this video. Enjoy! And now, it looks like I have some guests. Hey, you guys got here. How was the drive? Bit rocky crossing the border, but you know how it is. We did remember to pick up the Fago when we passed through Michigan, don't worry. It wouldn't be a Homestuck meetup without it. Hell yeah, y'all come into the living room and I'll get everything set up. I can't believe I'm going to a Homestuck slideshow party in 2021. Can you, though? I can, actually. I can believe that very strongly, for all of us. The fuck, okay, I have the remote, but I can never remember which one's the right input. Fuck yeah. Alright. Let's get started, then. Hey, everybody. Bet you didn't expect this many people this time, did you? Well, we've gathered everyone here today to cover a very important topic. We're here for the characters who are near and dear to our hearts, whether they want to be or not. Our grumpy little men. Our favorite matryoshkas of overcompensation and self-loathing. It's time for us to tell you how to determine a Vontus. All three Vontuses, in fact. I'm Bucky Grant. I'm Momo. I'm Riff. And I'm Robin. We are your Vantacessors for the evening. Without further ado, your feature presentation. Like last time, we couldn't separate one Vantus from his family. These assholes do have a lot of overlap. But they also have their own subclasses of the base Vantus tree, if you will. Let's start with just the general Vantus traits, then branch out into the specific iterations. First, Vantuses are talkative. They don't shut up, and you can't do anything but wait for them to burn themselves out. Compounding this, they're headstrong, if not outright stubborn. Pig-headed, even. This isn't a great place to start from, guys. The Vantuses are, no shocker, highly associated with the color red, tying them to Homestuck's larger themes of fate, anger, and power. In fact, the Vantus will have a significant relationship with anger, whether they wield it, suppress it, or learn to let it have its place. Vantuses also are disadvantaged and marginalized in their society due to existing in a unique minority. Not every Vantus type will exist specifically in a scenario as rare as one in a generation, but the isolation will be there. Vantuses also are not straight. They just aren't. A large part of their characterization involves dealing with attraction in a way that feels queer for their setting. That doesn't mean that the situation will map directly onto our current conception of queer sexuality, just that it is out of the norm for the character's setting. With enough interpretation, you can find some Vantus hints in nearly all forbidden love stories. They're also just interested in people and the way they interact. This manifests in a few ways across the three examples we're given, but Karkat's interest in rom-coms isn't that different from how Kankri looks into the ways people should interact with one another, and the way the signless is interested in how people could act toward one another. Vantus has come with a rigid, systematized worldview, whether of their own construction or borrowed from an existing social script. Their self-worth and self-actualization orbits this worldview, causing them to attribute meaningfulness and significance to their own actions, positive or negative. Their incredible stubbornness prevents them from changing this worldview easily. Also, Vantuses do this fun thing where they hate themselves by hating something or someone else. Carcat doesn't hate Carcat. Carcat hates past Carcat and future Carcat. Those are totally different guys. Kankri doesn't hate Kankri. Kankri hates his old work and his mental image of the signless. Different guys! Obviously, this separation is bullshit, but they're rather attached to it. They also have deep set messianic complexes. Everything is either their responsibility or their fault. At their best, Vantuses have a genuine interest in the well being of others in society. At their worst, they become incredibly self interested and retreat into their convictions when reality comes into conflict with their preconceptions. 
This can be summed up by the following. For Karkat, everything in the world is my responsibility in that it is my fault. For Kankri, everything in the world is my responsibility, i.e. my business. The sign list can go in a whole lot of directions on this one. Does he suffer from everything in the world is my responsibility? Or does his healthy having a family slash mom help him escape that? Speaking of which, you can define the mental health of Avantis by whether or not they had a good mom or mom-like entity. Bad mom or no mom Vantises have a much harder path out of the sink. The sink being their ability to confront their own flaws, including their propensity to be misogynistic. Did we mention that Vantises start out their stories more than a little misogynistic and will need to confront that to grow? Well, now we did. That won't stop them from telling you what's wrong with you, though. The degree to which this information is imparted politely, if not constructively, depends on the iteration. Okay, that's the base Vantis traits. Here's what they look like all together. This concludes the first part of determining Vantis eligibility. Okay, so four, three, two, fuck you. <laughs>Karkat also just does not overcome his misogynistic tendencies. He started out with them, and he treats women and girls around him as objects or subordinates for essentially the entire comic. This is so sick. Does she even know you're doing this? Doing what? Splitting up her time in a grid for your stupid rotating hate date plan. She will soon enough. What a presumptuous sack of shit. Put the pen down. And we never actually see him improve. The narrative never tasks him to apologize. Which he needs to do. He does need to do that. Karkat is initially forced to hide his minority identity on penalty of death. But Homestuck does basically drop this detail for the most part. Yes, it comes up again a little with Jack, but he isn't in hiding once they get off of Alternia. It becomes irrelevant, and Karkat is expected to just get over it. Karkat also has exceptionally low self-worth. He's a lovable grump in a manner that, quite frankly, works more to his detriment. His friends often struggle to call him on his poor behavior simply because it's very hard to hold him accountable without him punishing himself for stuff that isn't actually his fault. While he's focused on things out of his control, his actual responsibilities pile up. So where does that leave us? If we are to take some lesson from that, what is it? Try to be great and successful, but maybe not too great and successful? Or maybe don't try at all in some cases, because if you do, some giant fucking squid in the middle of nowhere is going to be like, not so fast, my hideous monster plans beg to differ. Don't you think we'd have been better off if we didn't even know about any of this dream bubble shit? What do you mean I have to heal? Is it not enough to be a martyr, endlessly dissatisfied? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's also just bad, very nasty to people, mean, bad crap, nasty. Is it because he's insecure? Maybe so. Okay, this is gonna sound preposterous given our last conversation, and I guess practically every conversation preceding it, and I'm probably gonna have to do something completely disgusting, like apologize. And even though I'll hate myself for it, I will totally mean it, I promise. Like, really, really mean it. You're gonna ask me to join your team, aren't you? Yeah. How did you know? I don't seem to have much choice now. Aradia kicked me off the good team. <laughs> wow, that is great. Wait, sorry. No. Wait, I don't have to apologize. That's right, you have no choice now. I apologize to myself for offering you a shitty, meaningless apology. Apology accepted, Carcat. Let's bury the Thresher with a totally platonic bro bulge bump. Bump. <laughs> Carcat is also not heterosexual and is attracted to more than one gender. Different interpretations of Carcat will have different reasons to highlight specific sexualities. Depending on what the reader cares about, he may instead be interpreted as exclusively attracted to men. 
He may also share his ancestors leaning towards Pan Quadrant attraction. Basically, he continues the Grand Vountus tradition of not being straight. Carcat doesn't have a bad mom. He has no maternal figure at all. Crabdad is both a dad and not really able to guide Carcat in too many things. This has a significant impact on his self-worth and ability to not be sexist. The narrative tries to be his mom and just can't compare because the narrative thinks that Carcat is fundamentally fine. He is not fine. Carcat starts out pretty bad at his job. This could turn into being good at his job if given the chance to develop his unique strengths. In Homestuck, Carcat is given the opportunity to develop his leadership skills, figure out why he even wants to lead, and improve a bit by the end of the comic. Other Carcats can either stagnate in their anger or improve with hard work and guidance. He also avoids constructive thought or action about his problems because it's uncomfortable for him. Carcat is risk averse. He can almost never be successfully challenged on his perspectives, which can be good or bad given the value of those perspectives. I just wanted to ask you something in confidence about the humans. Okay, what is it? Are you sure they're responsible for our misfortune? Yes, there's no doubt about it. Was it on account of malice or incompetence? I don't know, maybe both? Why does it matter? And lastly, out of all three Vontuses, Carcat has the strongest themes of forced isolation due to his upbringing and social position. So, here's that Carcat summary. All wrapped up with a little bow. Wait. Yes, yes Momo. Momo. Sometimes Carcats can be dads. Sometimes. Carcats can be dads. Just had to get that in there. No, you're right. That was important. So, now we can tell you who the Carcats are. Carcats. If a Carcat is a dad, we'll let you know he's a certified dad cat. We have quite a few examples for each Vantus, so we'll define a few and then run through the rest quickly with our points on the screen. Bucky, Janai, and Kelso actually cover Trek in his own episode of Will at Homestuck, but the guy is undeniably a Carcat. He is particularly insecure. He occupies a unique spot as one of the few ogres we know about, in the first movie at least, and he's a bit of a grumpy asshole. He also almost matches Carcat as a durst dreaming knight of blood. I'm partial to Raphael from the 2012 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show as a Carcat. He's stubborn, he's the red guy, and he'll definitely tell you what's wrong with you if your name is Leonardo. On top of that, he improves significantly in his role despite not engaging in self-criticism very often. Other Raphaels may also hit, but we agreed on this iteration specifically. Next is Catra. Yes, I said Catra, please come back. Catra and Adora are raised by Shadow Weaver, who is a mind fang, and that's where the circuit feeling is coming from. That's why she's like that. Catra hits so many Vantus and Carcat points, but she's just not a boy. Mean lesbian Carcat is real, and she's married to Adora. Edward Cullen is a Carcat, and no, I will not take that back. He's not technically marginalized, but he is part of an isolated sect of vampires. Edward refuses to ever admit fault, and his entire shtick is acting aloof and playing hard to get. He takes on the responsibility of not harming Bella by barring her from making her own choices and beats himself up when it doesn't work the way he wants it to. And he's pretty damn sexist to boot. Thanks, Meyer. Utena Tenjo's story and Carcats are specifically similar in the way these characters try to bolster themselves with masculinity, patriarchy, and adherence to the status quo. She and Carcat also certainly have self-esteem issues that they are fervently repressing. Revolutionary Girl Utena's existence as a response to censored or overlooked contemporary sapphic stories and the lesbian experience are comparable to Carcat's struggle with his own sexuality. But Utena gets more focus as the protagonist of a story with a smaller cast. Moreover, Utena and Karkat, at their best, are driven by a fundamental love for and identification with some of the most mysterious and often frightening members of their respective casts, but routinely struggle not to project or ignore their issues because of the discord they introduce into their worldview. If you're interested in this story, please check out a comprehensive trigger warning beforehand. 
but it's a very valuable and cathartic story. Okay, and here's the rest real fast. Uncle Stan from Gravity Falls. Hades from Supergiant Games Hades. Bojack Horseman from, well, Bojack Horseman. Zim from Invader Zim, obviously. Wirt from Over the Garden Wall. Samwise Gamgee from The Lord of the Rings. Marlin from Finding Nemo. Geralt of Rivia from The Witcher series. Rick Mitchell from The Mitchells vs. The Machines. And Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender. One vaunt us down, two to go. Next up is Cancri. We'll cover this once we've laid down the Signless's traits, but it's important to remember that Cancri is a single point on one timeline towards a Signless. Cancri's can get worse or better, depending on what they learn. Cancri, Vantus, and the rest of the Dan sisters are caricatures. Whether or not this is effective is a different story. It's not. But other Cancri's also tend to be snide commentary on, or parody of, a group or social friction from outside of the stakes. It's not bad satire as in lacking clarity and purpose. It's bad satire as in it disguises jokes about marginalized people as satire. Anywhere it could satirize, it doesn't acknowledge enough about Cancri's marginalized status to make a real critique. It's just punching down. Also, as previously covered in the Cronus video, the Dancestors contain Andrew Hussey's shallow critiques of 2012 Tumblr fan culture. Which, again, weren't critiques so much as jokes or just bad faith reproductions. Cancri's tend towards prioritizing adhering to theory over the actions of real people. He'll define someone's oppression and identify for them in the same breath that he commits, like, five microaggressions against them. We all know a guy like this, and he's unpleasant to deal with. On the other hand, if I'm being honest, I found Matuna's entire existence to be a pretty problematic impediment to the advancement and overall awareness of ableism and its painful, manifold consequences for unability persons. The speech impediment, frankly, I could do without, and I'm by no means ecstatic over his torrential bigotry and hostility. On the one hand, I want to be sensitive to him as a person and as a friend, but on the other, what kind of message does his behavior send? And frankly, I'm not crazy about the helmet either. As a friend, I wouldn't want to change anything about you. Well, not most things. I just think you may not be doing yourself or those who are similarly disadvantaged any favors with what I'm hoping is a perfectly innocent array of traits and mannerisms. But again, I say this with all due sensitivity. Kenkries also haven't overcome misogyny, if they've even considered it. The way Kenkri discusses marginalization as though it's separate from gender in Open Bound is emblematic of a common issue with misogyny existing in social justice spaces, especially because he's denying Porim's lived experiences. He also has weird hang-ups about Latula that seem to only exist because of the weird fan service mirroring the Dancestors are forced to engage in. Yes, but regardless, what I'm saying is, it's great we stayed away from that. It's helped me appreciate you as a friend and admire all your good qualities. Platonically, of course. Right, and I'm just saying, if my head was ever clouded by romantic feelings for you, I probably wouldn't be able to appreciate that about you. Or the way your hair flows in the wind when you scoot over some sort of obstacle on your device really fast. Or, I don't know if you remember, that time Mina baked everybody a cake? It was the first sweep anniversary of entering the game, one of the rare moments of solidarity and good cheer among our entire team at once. Everyone was raving about how good the fresh baked cake smelled, so you took a big sniff, I guess forgetting for a moment you couldn't smell, and then you quickly caught yourself and played it cool, making sure nobody noticed, which no one did. But I noticed, and I just thought that was kind of endearing. Anyway, I think that all would have been completely lost on me if we didn't have the strong platonic bond. I just thought I'd say that. Guess I'll get going now. See you around, Latula. <laughs> it's awful, right? It's it's supposed to be really fucking bad. Why? Are you reading this with the curtains like typed out in the, the script? Or I'm just reading off of what you can see. We're fucked for that. <laughs> Did you I just absolutely fucked? <laughs> Like, 
Corum points out he's sexist for refusing to acknowledge gender disparities, and he just steamrolls right over her. And am I right in being just as sure you're assiduously deconstructing every conceivable, hypothetical form of injustice, no matter how obscure, except those that I happen to think are kind of important? No, just no, Porum. We're not doing this. I am not going to pollute Karkat's utterly imperative crash course in which he is introduced to the absolute basics by indulging in your pet issues. Yes, how dreadful it would be for your 69 million word essay to get bogged down by even the faintest reference to the roles of gender in before and in Alternian civilization. Plus, he can't stop slut-shaming Purim to her face. I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry that I am, perhaps literally, the only one not to ever fall prey to your tireless omnidirectional solicitations or to get swept up in one of your innumerable flushed or collagenous flings. I happen to always prefer you as a friend, and in any case, I always prefer to lead a relatively chaste existence as it keeps me focused on fighting on behalf of truly important problems. Although staying relatively chaste to you, I suppose, is not saying much. Once again, I apologize. I blundered into the problematic territory of vacillation shaming, thus opening the floodgates to the myriad ways one may be disadvantaged upon by its staggering shame radius. I forgot to check my piety privilege, and here we are. I was going to cover this topic in a much later chapter of my lecture, but we've gotten badly derailed here. Trigger warning, derailment, train wrecks, choo-choo catastrophes. Karkat, I'm sorry for this interruption. I promise I'll get back to my critical lecture as soon as this promiscuous busybody leaves us in peace. Hashtag village to wheel to bass. An improved Kankri gets over his issues with women in our book, but he has to work at it. Also, Kankri is autistic. Because we said so. Yes, but also seriously, yes he is. Kankri has the Vantus tendency to need to be right to justify his own self-worth. He gathers information and goes from just policing his own behavior to policing others to try and prove that he's the best at being a person through experience. This makes him obnoxious to be around because he's either trying to one-up people or explain why they're wrong, if not both at the same time. He doesn't just tell you what's wrong with you, he explains minutiae about your life, good or bad, in excruciating detail and with unearned confidence. He also has a staunchly followed internal set of rules he abides by to try to be accepted by society. But his most rigid personal rules aren't necessarily derived from an external, societally accepted authority. He differs from a character like Gallic in the sense that he does not believe authority is inherently good and justified in decreeing rules. He can't. He doesn't benefit from that authority the way Gallic does. All the same, he hasn't necessarily grown past enforcing societal rules on himself and others. Kankri does have decently high self-worth, but he's constantly putting himself through the ringer to justify it to himself. He tries very hard to downplay his own stake in what he's arguing by claiming he's just doing this for other people, but really his ability to convince someone else that oppression is real is tied to his own internalized oppression. That being said, he also speaks and behaves like a reformist. Openbound in particular carries connotations of neoliberalism in his politics, particularly the way he criticizes his more radical counterpart in Porum. I just think there is inherent danger in muddying the waters of discourse by introducing social issues that which are suspect at best, thus consuming crucial resources from the limited cash or rhetoric which propels those narratives. And furthermore, one could argue it's more than a little problematic, offensive even, for you to be appropriating the lexicon of sensitivity used to advance awareness of major issues, thus reducing it to the level of buzzspeak and pseudoscience. It makes it more difficult for those of us who are genuinely focused on positive change to be taken seriously, that's all. I'm sorry, I just don't think there's much there. I fail to see how gender factors into the discussion in a way that could be effectively and rationally problematized. 
Where is the room for unexamined privilege in the dichotomy? I don't see it. And appropriating the talking points and awareness raising tactics for dubious issues like this is frankly frowned upon, to put it politely. Such appropriative gestures only serve to marginalize and invalidate those subject to serious, real-life struggles and oppression, and I guess I'm a little disappointed to see you being so blithely and inappropriately appropriatory. To be completely clear, you can't appropriate discussions of class and racism by discussing gender or sex. Those identities always overlap in some way. Hankry here is using the language of social justice to deny a voice to people not marginalized in the ways he's marginalized. This goes along nicely with his super trolling ability to deny just about anything, or at least to pretend it doesn't exist. Inside his group session, he pretends the team is still a team, like they're all comrades, like he and Mina are friends with no baggage that can't just be brushed away like water under the bridge. Hussey tried to address his point with the change society, but society is dead conversation, but it's a difficult justification to make given that the text also seems to forget Kankri is legitimately marginalized. He's also got a bit of a distrust of maternal figures, partially because of his unaddressed sexism, partially because he was continuously infantilized and mothered by the before an imperial state, and partially because he doesn't seem to have any female role models. Purim is far too young to be anything but a friend, but he reacts to her help and advice as though it's condescending and infantilizing. Basically, no good mom. Finally, Kenkri is a he-hem lesbian now. We will not be taking suggestions on this matter. So, who'd we clock as a Kenkri? Don't say it like that. No, no. He's got a point. We're gonna start strong with Roy Mustang from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Yes, he is. The Kankri signless sliding scale makes it easy to argue for a signless interpretation too, but I think there's a few story points that separate Colonel Mustang from being a signless. First, he isn't fighting for revolution, he's fighting for incremental change with himself at the helm. There is an armed revolution and upheaval going on, but he's the neoliberal hand on the wheel to guide everyone back into imperialism, working from the inside and all that. He also has incredible seer imagery from continually talking about looking to the future to just literally being blinded. Bada bang, bada boom, Roy is a cankery. Princess Bubblegum also strikes us as a cankery, but specifically one that got a bit worse after not addressing her flaws. Her use of science as a way to try and improve and perfect her people, as well as her reaction to being dethroned during the King of Uark, both contribute towards that cankery need to be right for evidence-based reasons, and her really not understanding why people act quote-unquote irrationally. Bubblegum will absolutely explain your problems to you in too much detail and then hand you an invention she thinks will fix it. It invariably worsens the problem. Also, not to get, like, political or anything, but neoliberalism's function is to excuse and usher in fascism when capitalism is threatened, and boy howdy does Bubblegum bring her fist down full force when she feels like the situation calls for it. Check out that Kay and Skittles video for more on the function of fascism under capitalism. That also applies to Roy Mustang. Yes, it does. Thank you. Adam Parrish, like Kankri, is a stubborn young man who needs to be right about everything while not accepting help, to and past the point of self-detriment. Adam and Kankri believe their society will not forgive any perceived slip-up or toe out of line. While their friends lament this, they have plenty of reason to believe their fears to be warranted. They self-identify as intellectual and academic, and their identities are desperately wound up in measuring up to a societal rubric despite their open disdain for the people who use that rubric. Kankri and Adam are strongly distrusting of their Purim Merriams and Dick Gansies in ways that come from real, lived experience. Give them a gift, do them a favor, and they think it's a leash. Okay, and really quickly through the rest because, again, we have so many of these. Emmett from Legally Blonde the Musical. Rabbit from Winnie the Pooh. The Doctor from Doctor Who, but especially Matt Smith's Doctor. Branch from Trolls. Soichiro Arima from Kare Kano. Izumi Miyamura from Horimiya. Freddie Benson from iCarly. Wow, that wasn't so bad. We're gonna get subtweeted to Helen back, you know that, right? We'll be fine. 
It'll be fine. Let's do the signless traits now as a nice apolitical conclusion. So the top signless sign is that the guy is an actualized leader. He has a concrete ideology, or so we're told. He talks about it and he spurs actual change. He has that up on the other two Vantuses big time. The signless also, by virtue of having a cool vampire feminist mom, addresses his misogyny. The Dolorosa would be disappointed if he didn't. Good mom for the win. The signless also has significant themes of both isolation and family. On the one hand, he's separated from almost all of his people living in hiding to escape violence. He's also torn between the world he lives in and his visions of the forest. On the other hand, he had more of a family than most trolls ever would in the Dolorosa, the Disciple, and the Psionic. One of the only things we know about him for sure is that his relationships with these three trolls transcended quadrant relations. In fact, the Signless's pan-quadrant attraction, both in terms of the number of partners he had and the way they behaved towards one another, deserves its own point. After all, it's not gay as in happy, it's queer as in polycule. OT3 real. OT3 real! The Signless also centers his philosophy around self-worth. The Alturian Empire has a lot of its propaganda work done for it by instilling extremely poor self-worth into the population of warm-blooded trolls. He doesn't do anything useful for the Alternian Empire, but he declares his worth anyways and demands real concessions be made to recognize that worth. That's the revolution. Despite his revolution, however, he didn't intend to die a martyr. He was angry that the world he poured everything into trying to save didn't save him back. At least at his death, regardless of where he's at through the rest of his life, he knew he deserved better. This isn't exactly a signless trait, but it combats the idea of passive martyrdom as a trait. You might even say he has miles to go before he sleeps. Uh... Like we mentioned before, though, the differences between these characters amount more to points on a timeline than to entirely different characters. You can place Karkat at the beginning, and depending on what kind of story he's given, he can either lean towards understanding people and being able to lead a revolution, or diving too deep into theory and failing to resurface. Kankris have the ability to end up as signlesses with hard work too, but it'll be difficult for them to fight against the neoliberalism. Or to put it more simply, there is only one step, and it is Crab. There's also some overlap between Sinlesses and Kenkries that's worth covering quickly before giving our Sinless examples, since there's only a few. First, in my opinion, the Sinless is fundamentally a Kenkri who learned to listen to other people and wasn't scared off from it. He was raised by a feminist and seeks love and community. Basically, the Sinless was able to learn lessons Kenkri never did about how people relate to one another. Both Kankri and the Signless are opposed to their societies, but their revolutions couldn't be more different. Where the Signless is in a violent authoritarian nightmare world and rebels by emphatically stating he deserves to love and be loved, Kankri lives in a passive-aggressive pillow cage and rebels by refusing any help or criticism. Conversely, the narrative discards Karkat's ability to really rebel against authority. He has the seeds of a revolutionary storyline somewhere, but he's too accustomed to the taste of leather to give up on it just yet. Also, Kankri and the Silas are both wife guys. And Karkat could be if he wasn't a coward. When Avantus is in a relationship, you will know. So that brings us to our examples for the Signless. Again, these guys will overlap with Kankri's a bit, and we actually deliberated for a while on a few of them, but they won out as Signlesses overall. So, first, to complement the Karkat that is Edward Cullen, we have Carlisle Cullen as a Signless. He's the one who brought the vegan vampires together in the first place and kicked off the struggle to be a better vampire. He inspired and brought together, and to some extent, saved the entire Cullen family. While he wasn't a preacher, he was raised by one, which is probably where the vague preacherliness comes from. The degree to which vampires are actually marginalized is still shaky, but the conflict in the series does revolve around the non-standard choices the Cullen family makes. These vampires really queered heterosexuality. That's not allowed. I call foul. I am sorry, Riff, but I'm afraid that does allow Momo to take a penalty shot.
Avatar The Last Airbender doesn't just have one signless, it has two. Aang seems like a pretty good shoo-in for an unusually enthusiastic Vontus, especially in terms of being an actualized leader. However, even more than Aang, Katara behaves like a Kankri growing into a signless. She's the last of her kind, at least without traveling across the entire world, and she narrowly avoided being killed by the Fire Nation as a child. Katara annoys others by being motherly, which in her case boils down to controlling, nosy, and assuming she gets to say things about my life, or prim and proper in a prissy way when it comes to talk. Her stubbornness and anger at injustice, driving her to choose the right thing over practically anything else, narratively drive her from a cankery toward an effective revolutionary and powerful fighter. We return to 2013 to remind you that the Lorax, whether he's from the novel or portrayed by Danny DeVito, is a signless. He's stubborn and angry and won't hesitate to tell you what's wrong with the situation and with how you're approaching it. He speaks for people or entities inside of a system with a strange adjacency to that system and is the central character of a pro-environment ideology. But with what he was trying to accomplish all but extinguished, he leaves us with the message that it will take far more than one person to change the world. I also think Mara from She-Ra and the Princesses of Power is a signless. She was initially vilified by the way Light Hope and other First One's authorities wanted the power of She-Ra to be wielded, and it took Adora a while to find out what Mara was trying to accomplish. It turned out that Mara rebelled and tried to do something good and succeeded in bandaging a larger issue, but sacrificed herself in the process. She didn't want to die for her cause, but found no other choice. This quote that she says to Adora is also incredibly signless. You're worth more than what you can give to other people. You deserve love, too. That's really the crux of his argument as well. Every single person is worth care, himself included. Also, to call back to my Catra assessment earlier, Catra is a car cat raised by a mind fang, and Adora is a Friska raised by a mind fang that looks up to a signless. You're welcome. One of the reasons this video exists in its current form is because the different forms of Vontus, though, while distinct, are often very intertwined. Two examples of this intertwined web of Vantus alignment are Izuku Midoriya from the anime My Hero Academia and Steven Universe, both in the original series and in Steven Universe Future. Steven Universe begins his story as a signless. He was a child who was born into and marked by a conflict he didn't start. There isn't anyone like Steven, and while his family celebrates this, it's a point of contention. His mom's dad and close but unrelated family taught him how to be kind to people and to center thoughtful behavior. He's an incredibly skilled speaker and leader, and his empathy is key to his success. He does have strong themes of family, but he also deals with isolation and feeling ostracized. On top of that, he really is an unwilling martyr. It's not that he was fighting for good and his contribution was suddenly ended. It's that he never should have been responsible for, nor could he as a child consent to the war he was forced to fight in. By Steven Universe Future, Steven's world no longer demands signlessing of him, and he begins to operate as a kangaroo. Whether a gem war or a video game that can kill you for real, Steven and Kangri have both been through traumatic situations wherein their friends were seconds from falling apart at any moment. While Steven had more success than Kangri, both felt a responsibility to hold the family together. Now, in the aftermath, they struggle to find some sense of control over their lives and manifest that struggle by trying desperately to stay relevant in their friends' lives. It's important to us to mention that we do not think Steven has degraded or lost anything of worth in his emotional journey. He was dealing with an unimaginable amount of pressure and responsibility for an adult, let alone a child, and was never able to be upset about the unfair hand he was dealt until long after it was over. Because of that timeline from Cancri to Signless, where you have to learn you're actually fighting for the people, Izuki Midoriya begins the story as, in our opinion, mostly a Cancri. Without a naturally occurring quirk, he's a minority and arguably disabled. His inability to tell anyone about being born quirkless but gaining one for all puts him under threat of being stripped of his abled status should his secret be revealed. While the treatment of quirkless individuals isn't culling in the before in sense, the implication is that he needs to provide an illusion of normality and able-bodiedness as someone gunning for the literal position of ideal human. His ideals are built on his internal image of saving people and sometimes go against the system, but he considers the system the best way to accomplish it. He also has a strong mental image of himself as All Might's successor and what sort of self he needs to maintain to fulfill that role. His story does seem to be arcing towards a signless one with recent developments, and we can't deny the English VA connection, but he's not there quite yet. 
Anyways, here's another horrible diagram we made to illustrate what's going on with the one for all holders in Bakugo, just for you guys. We will not be elaborating further. To round out the signlesses, our honorable mentions go to Orpheus from Hadestown and Quasimodo from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. So why even do this? Why make this video? As always, I'm interested in making characters more digestible, yes, but we also have significant investment in characters that admittedly either suck or are very vague and thrive on fan interpretation. We like the crabs. I think any analysis inevitably betrays what's important to you about attacks on a personal level, and that vulnerability isn't necessarily a bad thing. We point at Carcat and say he's not straight because a lot of us related to the way he struggled with his sexuality. We point at Cancri and say he's autistic because we relate to the way he finds rules to follow but doesn't quite grasp why his approach to said rules is off-putting. We relate to the signless because, to be completely honest, his ideology is rather bare-bones and easily interpreted to fit with a lot of different revolutionary narratives, but still inspires readers. This video is our interpretation based on our experiences. It's how we saw the comic and how we grappled with the themes and ideas as they were presented. We love the crab men, and we love thinking about what makes them tick, basically. Get in the tongs! Get in, Get the, in the tongs! Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time for hopefully an excellent analytical subject. Majority of pairings are better, include me. I'm cockalicious, so delicious. My body stays vicious. All the hobbles feeling nervous, cause I'm doing some fitness. I hot's my witness. But that ship curls the pet's tail, and he'll be needing all the towels, cause I'ma make him sweat pails.